Okay, so um, this session um, I'll explain a few things and uh, some time for questions and then we'll do another meditation session. So um, just to clarify some parts of what we've done so far. Um, so far we've just been using uh, close placement on the body and there's each of the four close placements has many different meditations that fall under that heading. So we've done a uh, close placement on the breath, which was um, kind of the most common thing, right? This is the most common meditation that you find, isn't it? And I'm guessing that all of you have done some kind of breathing meditation before in your life. But what the purpose of that breathing meditation was uh, is perhaps somewhat abstract. Um, <clears throat> so when we're doing mindfulness of anything, um, mindfulness on anything like the breath helps us develop concentration, right? That's like the first thing that it does, develops concentration. And why do you need concentration? Because most of your mistakes are born from distraction, right? Um, and why do you need concentration? It makes whatever you want to do more effective. Right? So just right off the bat, anytime you turn your attention to something on purpose, right? On purpose, rather than just kind of incidentally, um, it has power. And I'm hoping that you feel some difference in your mind between the way you are in your life when you let the mind do whatever it wants and when you actually decide to make it do something. Right? Is there a difference in the quality of your mind and kind of what it, how it feels, the way it functions? And it feels like, to us, letting the mind do whatever it wants is relaxing. It seems like that's the thing to do, and then when we have to focus, that's work, right? And so then when you have to focus in meditation, part of you is feeling like this is work. And, you know, that's okay and that's normal. Um, but what we want to unpack is the fact that when you live in distraction, when you let the mind do whatever it wants, it never processes anything completely. Yeah? Which actually makes us more tired. Which is why it's so hard to sleep, which, which is why when we actually sleep, it's not always satisfying. Which is why sometimes it takes us a long time to settle down or to shift gears between activities. Because when you're distracted, you're not fully engaged with what's happening. So you never really process what's happening. You kind of half process it. Um, and then you're kind of catching up what just happened while trying to do what is happening and planning for what's going to happen, and you're never really there. So it, it is a, it's a shifting to actually be with what you're doing in this moment. It is a little bit of work because it's new, but actually it's kind of healthier for your mind. And it winds up being something that gives your mind a great deal of peace. And just coming to the present moment itself, using some focal object, even just the breath, helps settle down the coarse distractions, helps settle down the coarse negative states of mind. Okay? So, um, you know, calling uh, meditation practice, practice is a really good word, right? You have to practice. It's not going to be like just immediately. You know, you have to keep coming back and keep coming back, right? So every moment that you choose not to let your mind go off with the fairies, right? Not to let it sink and drift and stagnate is something worth celebrating because this is new, right? And also we want to break the association between focus and stress, right? Usually when we're focused, we're also stressed. And when we're relaxed, we're also sleepy. But those associations don't need to exist. That's what we're at, that's what we're used to, right? But you can be relaxed and focused. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to get to. A very steady focus that is not at all tight, not at all stressed out. But we, in our life, don't really know how to focus without adding stress to the focus. Because when we're really focused, it's usually, you know, at work or driving or it's an important conversation, you know, so it's got all of this emotional loading. So we do know how to focus, but we don't really know how to focus without it being tense. 
except in very small moments. Maybe if you were someone who's a musician, yes, <laughs> someone who is an artist, um, someone who, I don't know, has an activity that you do so often that it comes easily. You know, even driving, if it's driving somewhere, you drive all the time where the traffic isn't too bad, as opposed to a new place that you're driving in. Yeah, do you know that feeling of, of driving somewhere very familiar that you've done a million times and you know how to navigate it almost, quote, without thinking, and yet there is focus there, but it's kind of a calm, happy focus? You know, and if something changes in the road, because you're still on top of being focused, you can make an adjustment, but it has a different f feeling than when it's a whole new place that you're driving in and suddenly you have to change and it's quite tense and you think, oh, my turn off, oh, my exit, you know, and you kind of <laughs> tense up with the focus. So it's not like you can't ever do this and you've never done this, it's just not as common. You know, if you think of the amount of time in a day that's spent in happy focus, happy, calm, relaxed focus, it's not like a huge amount of the day, probably. Do you reckon? Right? As opposed to, you know, work focus, maybe you are focused for eight hours straight, but it's not like happy focus. It's like tense. Yeah. Or you relax a day that you're relaxing. Are you focused on the relaxed day or are you just blobbed out, you know, like a house cat? Yeah. So, you know, we've been a house cat many, many times, and it has not yet led to our awakening. So we want to do something different with the fact that we wound up with a human form. Okay, so um, close placement on the body. First we do, we watch the breath. Then we can do things like working with the senses. Yeah, when we did eye, ear, nose, etc. And what's happening in a normal day is our focus is moving between the senses, but without intention, right? It's jumping from what's interesting, right? And as soon as it loses interest, it jumps. So um, the mind, is primarily engaged with one sense at a time, including the mental sense, but not all of them simultaneously. So you might think, I am seeing at the same time as hearing, at the same time as smelling, as the same time as thinking, when actually they're happening one after the other very quickly, and you're just bouncing between them. So you are seeing while you think of sight, and you are hearing while you think of sound, um, but while you're thinking of sound, you know, images appear, but they're not your main object of engagement. Yeah? It, it, there's a, a different feeling in your mind when you make the choice to look as opposed to passively looking. Okay, so um, the mind without direction will just bounce around. Yeah, it'll just bounce around quite randomly to what seems fun, yeah, or what seems soothing or away from what confronts it. And so by doing this meditation where we choose, we're kind of like taking control back. Yeah, we're taking control back. And taking control back, again, we learn how to concentrate, and that's always useful. And for us that aren't really excellent at concentrating yet, doing a shift between objects can sometimes keep you from falling asleep. You know, and you know, it's, it's a long time to sit for an hour, and even though we broke it up into two sessions, if you're new to retreat, it, you know, it's hard, right? So if it was hard, that's normal. Sometimes um, shifting, okay, eye, ear, like that, it keeps the mind having a project. Yeah, but you could do a whole session just on one if you were by yourself at home and you wanted to just be with sound, yeah. So that would be fine, you know, in your own time if you want to slow it right down and just pick one that's totally effective and do shorter sessions. Um, so now the next two close placements, that, or the next two meditations under the heading of close placement on the body are the confronting ones, okay? They're, they're meditating on the repulsiveness of the body and the nine cemetery meditations. Right, so these are like the most confronting of all the meditations that we're going to do. And they seem contradictory to the teachings on perfect human rebirth. Yeah, but they're not. All right, so the teachings on perfect human rebirth say your body is perfect because it's human. Your body is perfect for what? 
It's perfect for transformation, it's perfect for mental development, because you have enough intelligence and enough health to progress. Yeah, it's perfect. If you were a house cat, you cannot study. Yes? If you were a God realm being, it would be so delicious to be there that you would forget about working for the welfare of sentient beings. You would be drunk with pleasure. So a human life is perfect, right? Because you have enough suffering and enough happiness, right? It's that perfect balance rebirth. So that's that teaching. And now we do this meditation on why the body is disgusting. And you go, why? <laughs> right? What is the point of all of this? And if you read the sutra, it gets like very elaborate into like, think of the pus and the blood and the tendons. And you're just like, oh, enough, right? You know, the poo, right? Everything gross. All the toilet things. Yeah, and you go right into it. And you're trying to gross yourself out. Yeah, you're trying to just be like, oh, what? <laughs> why on earth would you do that? And why is that not contradictory to thinking still this is a perfect vessel? Do you have anything that comes up just intuitively? <clears throat> yeah, 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 someone has studied. Yes, please tell me. <laughs> tell me your interpretation. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, to understand the truth of suffering. So even if you hate your body, right, and lots of people do, you still have attachment to it. Yeah. Even if you're annoyed with it, even if you wish it was different, um, you exaggerate what it is. Maybe also to be just the modesty. Modesty. Yeah. Yeah. That can help. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it can help us not be attached to other people as well, right? If you think of the most gorgeous creature, right, your Hollywood movie star crush, there is poo in their intestines, yeah. right? Right away you're like, oh, okay, yeah, never mind. Yeah, it helps, right? It just sort of cuts. It cuts through the illusion. It cuts through the lie that thinks that there is some sort of perfection and some sort of cleanness and some sort of appeal all by itself, unrelated to your mental attitude. Yeah? There's cool there, and it's brown and stinky. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> right? Yeah, yuck, right? Actually, it could uh, connect us too. It could, but this is not the point of this meditation. <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's tricky, right? Because I, there's another meditation which would be a very excellent to do to think about our, our shared human experience, to think about our interrelatedness, to think about gratitude, the way the earth sustains us, the way we go back to the earth and sustain it. You know, that kind of stuff is really good to do. It's beautiful. Um, and to think of kind of the natural cycle of life in nature, and you know, that is really enriching. And do that sometimes. But this is not that meditation. You know, so this is why Buddhism makes your mind so flexible because you realize you're working with relative truths. You can just as easily see the body as perfect as see it as disgusting, and both of them are useful if you are de-identified from it. Because what you're really coming down to is, this is not me. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's what you're working your way towards. So it's easier to think, this is not me, if you can first be a little bit uh, about it, <laughs> right? Um, so if it's you, you're endlessly trying to perfect it, yeah? If this is you, then you're in the mirror trying to like fix your face somehow, <laughs> you know, you know, trying to get your good angle, right? Minimize your double chin, I don't know. You know, if this is you, you're trying to fix it all the time, yeah? If this is you, you're always trying to fix it and make it perfect, yeah? Trying to do your hair, right? Yeah, trying to suck in your gut, yeah, trying to look strong, right, trying to look feminine, trying to look however you think is appealing to others so that they'll respond to you with love and respond to you with affection, right? This is what we do if we think the body is us, right? If the body is not us, it just saves time, right? Oh, it saves time. And, and also, you can remember that Perhaps your best friendships and your best romantic relationships might have started from some physical connection, some physical, like this was an attractive person and I wanted to go towards them, but you know that the relationships that have lasted have been because of a heart connection 
right? That maybe initially there was something physical, but if it lasts any length of time, it no longer becomes about the physical. Yeah, and if it's only the physical, it ends badly, right? Um, everyone was a teenager, right? You remember, <laughs> right? And, and also you remember that there are people in your life who are probably not attractive at all conventionally, right? In terms of the world, someone who has, you know, real dodgy face, all sorts of wonkiness, but because they're your friend and because you love them, their face is dear to you. It's appealing to you because of your relationship with them, how much you love them. Yeah, and so it's actually stopped being about that coarse physicality quite quickly in a mature relationship. Yeah, I mean, can you think of, we all have seen, you know, friends in our life who the world will, doesn't think are beautiful, but we think they're beautiful because of how valuable and beautiful they are in our life, right? Um, you know, if you think of your, you know, grandparents, if you knew them when they got very, very old, yeah, or very, very old people in your life, the old people that we love, all of that age is endearing and appealing. And part of us, you know, can impute what those lines mean, you know? All of the laughter of that life there, yeah? All of the grief here, all of the wisdom there, you know? We can read into that appearance, you know? So uh, what we see on the surface is what we give all the credit to in terms of what we engage with, both with others and ourselves, when part of us has always known it's been something deeper. Yeah, it's just a vessel, you know, like this is the car <laughs> that we're riding in. Yeah, and this hasn't always been our body. Yeah, we've had other bodies. And even this body that feels so us, so me, changes constantly, right? Even science will tell you all of the cells replace themselves every seven years. Right? You're a totally different body than seven years ago. It seems the same, you know, a few more lines, but it's totally different. And moment to moment, it's different. So for your first step in de-identifying from the body is seeing its changeability. Yeah, you're like, where is this body? Is it the same one as this morning? Does your body feel exactly the same to you as when you first woke up this morning? Exactly the same. Right? Changes in energy level, changes in comfort and discomfort, yeah? changes in stiffness or flexibility. You know, there's all sorts of changes, digestion changes. Right? So even just from this morning, it's a different body. Yeah? Never mind you know, all of the transitions through childhood and growing and getting bigger and bigger. Yeah? So even just in this life, who are you? What is this? You know, this, this vessel is a constantly changing thing. So being with the impermanence of that helps loosen you up. Yeah. On the one hand, we, we can be with us, with our body. And on the other hand, we are told that we should really take care of our body mm. because it is our home for now. Yeah, yeah. We pray for help, so... Not contradictory. No? No, not at all. Both can be true. Yeah, both can be true. Can, can you see how both can be true? That you have to look after this body and treat it with such care and be so happy about it and appreciative of it and give it good food and take it on a walk sometimes and, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but at the same time, you're trying to de-identify from it. And so what's going to work, right? So we have to ask ourselves, what's the project? If the project is to overcome attachment, then we have to balance the view of what it is. If the project is not to overcome attachment, then something else is happening, right? And so attachment is what's saying, I am the body, yeah? Which is what leads to all our, you know, sort of craving for stuff, yeah? To make it all shiny or whatever, right? <laughs> but when you are working on de-identifying from it, you first see its changeability, loosens you up. Then you see how it's a bit yucky, Right? Because it is, right? <laughs> Loosens you up, right? And then you go, is it um, existing all by itself from its own side? What is the body anyway? You point to one part of it. It's like, no, that's not the body, that's the shoulder. And you're like, oh, okay, so that's the shoulder. Where's the shoulder? Is it this part of the bone? Is it that part of the bone? Where, at what point does it become the shoulder? Right? At what point does it become 
the body. You know, you start to loosen up what is even the body. Where does the external, quote, external world stop and the internal world begin? You say, oh, the surface of my skin. But is that true? If someone comes into your personal space, before they've even touched you, you feel a sense of, oh, that's nice, or, oh, a bit too close. You know, you feel it. And that personal space bubble adjusts given context. It adjusts given, you know, cultural conditionings, right? City people need less space than country people, yeah? You know, so like where the external meets the internal is not so clear. So then you start to soften that up. And then you start to soften up the idea that the body is the self at all, yeah? Because you might think, okay, impermanent, not um, appealing in and of itself, not inherently existent, yet still it's me though, I, or I live here, or I'm the boss of it, right? So then it starts to feel like there's like a tiny you hanging out here saying, move your arm, say a word, like a tiny director or a tiny boss in there, right? It starts to feel like that. And you go, haha, all right, that must be it. And then you look for it and can't find it. Yes. And this is very nice. Right. Very sad. Hmm? Very sad. Not sad. <laughs> Liberating. Liberating. Liberating, right? But it is sad on the service level because you're like, oh, all my life I've been working on a fruitless project, right? My whole life has been trying to, like, achieve something for this that isn't there. Oh. <laughs> right, so yeah, in that way it's sad. But, um, but it's freeing then because now you don't have to. So uh, always remember that when we're talking about no self in Buddhism, we're talking about something very specific, that there are two selves. There is the self that exists and the self that does not exist. The self that does not exist at all, even conventionally, is the one that seems to be independent, inherently existent, one permanent thing, a core. That's the one that's not there at all, not even nominally, but that is the one we identify with. Yeah, that's the one we think we are. Our personality, our traits, right? Our behaviors, our mannerisms, our body, our speech, etc. You know, we, this is who we think we are, and that has never been us, right? Those are behaviors, right? Those are habits that have hung out on a mental continuum that does have continuity, right? But again, it's like a river, right? A river that's picked up all sorts of things along with it as it moves. And you can say, this river has this name, but when you point to it, you're pointing at a movable thing, right? And then there's the self that does exist. And we have never met that one, yeah? The self that does exist is that which is merely labeled on the collection. And anything more than that is an exaggeration. Okay, so what does exist is that which is labeled, right? Here. But as soon as you say what is here, you realize that that is also a collection. On a collection. On a collection. On a collection. And so if you try to find the substantial substance of you-ness, you will not find it, and yet there is something there, right? So coming to find that there is no inherently existent self is almost nihilism, but not quite, right? You're going right to the edge of it and then not going off the deep end, right? Right to the edge. So if you feel yourself going, boom, you know, into, oh, therefore nothing exists, therefore nothing matters, then you have gone too far. Right, so you go right up to the edge of that, yeah? And, you know, there are complex ways of getting your mind to this place, and there are simple ways of getting your mind to this place, but it's the repetition of it that will transform it from a thought to an actual realization that will cut the root of your negative behaviors and your suffering, right? It's the repetition. So it has to start intellectual. And even the intellectual understanding starts to interrupt bad habits, starts to interrupt the way we engage with our suffering. So a simple way is to finish all of your sentences with merely labeled by the mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm drinking a glass of water 
merely labeled by the mind. Which is delicious, merely labeled by the mind, right? And now my thirst is quenched, merely labeled by the mind, right? I'm seeing my friends, merely labeled by the mind, right? I, I am hearing an obnoxious leaf blower machine, which is merely labeled by the mind, right? I'm sitting in a pretty room, merely labeled by the mind. You know, you see what this does to you? If you, you know, it's crazy, right? You don't have time to do this always. But, you know, it loosens up the reality, and you see the way doing that prevents negative states of mind or interrupts negative states of mind. Yeah? Think in particular about your relationships. Yeah, here is that person at work who I do not like and gives me suffering, merely labeled by the mind. Right? And then you're like, oh, right. So, not by themselves then. Yeah, not by themselves then. I have labeled difficult person. I have, dif uh, I have labeled this experience as suffering. I have labeled, you know, you're taking the power back. Before you do this, you feel like things are happening to you all the time. Good things are happening, bad things are happening, things are happening to you. That's the way it feels when you have an inherently existent self, that one that doesn't exist when you're identified with that guy, things happen to you. If you are not identified that way, you realize things are happening from you and then bouncing back. And then you go even more deeply and you just realize there is interconnectedness, right? And my personal experience is not so personal as I thought, yeah. That the way my mind is has an impact on the people around me and that impact doesn't exist from its own side by way of its own character, but there is still impact, you know? So you're sort of doing this delicate balance, right? Which is acknowledging that there is cause and effect. Karma does exist. Actions have effects. At the same time as understanding that nothing stands alone, all by itself, just as it seems. Yeah. And so we have to work our way up to it or work our way into it. Yeah. Which is why we start with coarse and go to more and more subtle. Right? We start with the coarse objects, body, right? Slightly more subtle is feeling, slightly more subtle is mind, most subtle is phenomena. Yeah? We do these from the perspective of most coarse is impermanent, right? But still, just thinking about impermanence helps, right? Then you start thinking about when they have disturbing emotions and karma involved, there is suffering, right? Then you go to empty and selfless, yeah, which leads you to nirvana is peace. Yeah, so um, you're just going, it's a series, and so each of these meditations that we do, we're just slowly working from coarse to subtle, trying to loosen up our grasp on the false reality, the deceptive reality, because that will lead to freedom, that will lead to happiness, good behavior, right? Kindness, more effectiveness in your life, all these good things, right? So, um, so the repulsiveness meditation is specifically to antidote attachment, right? That's what it's for. So if um, you're feeling full of self-loathing and hatred and, um, you know, having some sort of yuck sick in bed with the flu kind of day, probably don't do this meditation on that day, right? Do this meditation on days when you're feeling healthy and robust and ready to really work with your mind's attitude towards the body, yeah? Um, but then really do it, yeah? Gross yourself out a bit. So we'll do it today and just see what happens. And then you do the corpse meditation, which is like really excellent, yeah? Because <laughs> you're realizing, ah, I am not the body. Excellent, but also this body is going to fail me at some point. What will be left? What will be left when this body no longer works? Is there something that's going to be left? So it's helping bring impermanence in a very coarse way into your life that this body will end, definitely. 
I need to prepare myself in some way. If I don't believe in future lives, I at least want to believe in legacy, right? What is the lasting impact I want to have on this world when this body no longer works? And if you do believe in future lives, what do you want to take with you once this isn't here anymore? Yeah, you're taking with you your habits. Are they all useful, right? Is your mental approach towards your body useful? Because even if you get a whole new body and it's all bright and shiny, you'll take your same attitude about your body with you, right? We all know conventionally beautiful people who hate themselves and conventionally ugly people who love themselves, right? So it's really never been about what other people say your body is or isn't. It's your mental attitude towards it, isn't it? So you could be reborn into the most glorious body ever made and still hate it if you have this mental habit of hating it, right? Um, exaggerating what it is to you. Yeah. So again, you know, when we do these meditations that are a little bit full on, remember, it's not an act of like punishment. It's, it's a way of being objective. Yeah. This isn't me. I'm just using it right now. So I need to take care of it while I'm using it. But it's going to wear out like a car, right? Like a pair of clothes. And then you get a new one. It's fine. Yeah. But, you know, kind of, yeah, you're loosening yourself up about it. Right? So you're like, thanks, old buddy, you've served me well. Anyway, next. <laughs> right? That's the way we want to get with it. So um, close placement on body, we'll do those ones. We'll also do some meditations on uh, the elements within the body, because that, again, helps loosen the grip, and that's quite a nice one. Um, and then we'll move on. But do you have any questions, um, particularly about close placement on the body or any of the other things so far? Yeah. I did not really get the, when you separated between the false me and the true me. Yeah. About the true me. You want me to say it again? Yeah, if you can please elaborate that a little bit further. Yeah. So, um, the false me, was that bit clear? It was the real me that's less clear. Yeah. Everybody else same. You, you get the self that does not exist at all, which one that is. The troublemaker. The pretender, yes. So then um, the one that does exist, it's, it is harder to understand because it's so subtle. But what we're talking about is, okay, so a person, just a person in general, is labeled on a basis, right? And that basis is a body and a mind, right? And we're talking, you know, a body and a mind, but not necessarily that those body and mind are sort of permanent things, right? So a person is labeled on a body, but the body is changing and made of parts. A person is labeled on the mind, but the mind is changing and made of parts. So you're, you're placing a, kind of an arbitrary label on a collection of things that aren't so stable. But as soon as you place that label there, it sort of appears back to you as if it's this kind of consistent phenomenon. Right? So if you use that very simple example that Lama Zopa likes to use a lot, I like as well, of um, the way the mind projects and the way that projection then bounces back. Okay, so think of the letter A. Yeah, before you learned English, it was just some lines there, right? It was just some lines and it had no meaning to you, right? Like how I am with Hebrew, I'm like, there's some lines. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> they're like, at the supermarket, you know, it's just there. I'm like, why would I know that? And they're like, a sign. It says supermarket. I'm like, in no way does it say supermarket to me, <laughs> right? right? But to you, it just bounces out as if it's obvious, right? So think of this, the letter A. Before you met, before you and letter A met, it was just lines. And then someone introduced you, right? So this is the letter A, right? This line, this line, and this line means it's an A. And you still were like not totally convinced. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay, sure. But you would forget. Yeah. It took some repetition for you to, sit, to buy into that belief. Right? So there was always something there. That's the point. There was always some lines there. But those lines only had meaning once you attributed meaning to them and believed in it. And then as soon as you believe in it, now it seems to come back to you. The A seems to pop off of the page and tell you that it's an A, yeah? 
And that is the lie. It seems like it's telling you it's an A. You forgot you told it. Yeah? You told it is the reality. It telling you is the lie. Yes? So everything is like that, where you see something and then you label on top of it. But it seems like the label is telling you what it is not the other way around. So that's the illusion. Things appear to exist from their side when in fact they're labeled by the mind on a collection of parts. Now they still have to be labeled on a valid basis, meaning it has to accord with conventional reality. I can't call this an elephant, right? Just because there's something there doesn't mean I can arbitrarily name it. But I can't say that it's a good bowl I can say it's a bowl, right? And I can call it a good bowl, but I know that is my opinion, right? Some people say good, some people say bad. And then bowl is only on the basis of fulfilling the definition of a bowl. It has to have sides, it has to have a bottom, an empty space inside, right? And if it doesn't have those characteristics, it's not a valid basis to call a bowl. But, you know, so it seems like, okay, well, it's a valid basis, so there it is, and yet, Find it. Where is the bowl? Anything you point to is a piece, not it. Yeah, and the person is the same way. So just in a very gentle, nominal way, you can say, there you are there. But as soon as you try and find you, it dissolves into pieces. It doesn't dissolve into nothing. It dissolves into pieces. So the true is the one... Which is unlabeled? It is the fact that it is only merely labeled on the parts. And it, the lie is that it seems more than that. Yeah. So the reality is just that which is labeled on the collection. Yeah. And the collection then starts to, to, to lie to you and say, no, I made the label. Yeah, right? That's what I want yeah to the other way around. You labeled that. So it just, you know, so it's very, it's subtle, right? It's really very, very um, deep. And that's why we have to kind of like work our way into it. Um, <clears throat> even the idea that <clears throat> the self changes is a little bit confronting, even though just science helps us understand that, right? Basic psychology, basic biology tells us the self is changing moment to moment. And kind of objectively, you're like, oh, sure. But still there's a part of you that is holding on to some sense that you there is a core in there that is identical to your childhood that's just like gathered experiences to it but you still you feel like kind of the same old you as when you were five years old just somehow more polite i don't know <laughs> you know you might learn some things but it's still the basic you you know with a better vocabulary i don't know you know it sort of feels that way and yet you can't point to the essential substance it is identical from that moment to this one. It's like a river, yeah. So um, even the idea that it's changing starts to kind of loosen your grip a little bit. And seeing that you're changing is freeing. Just that course level is very freeing. If you think that this is just who I am, you can't change. If you think I'm changing all the time, let's try and make it positive, then you can. Yeah, but I mean, how many people have you heard say, it's just who I am, accept it? And it's like, all right, well, since you've decided so, okay, it is. But that's only because you've decided, not because that's a fundamental truth, right? And yet, you know, for some people coming to a realization that their habits and characteristics are very strongly habituated, it can be empowering to say, this is just who I am for a minute but don't stay there forever. Do you know what I mean, that difference of, okay, this is who I am, I'm, you know, a little bit easily distracted, I'm not so great with details, I'm kind of silly, all these things, okay, that's just who I am, but finish the sentence, so far, <laughs> right? This is just who I am, so far, right? Then you're closer to truth. Yeah, so, I mean, are you seeing how this these processes kind of help make reality more true, <laughs> right? Come bring you closer to what life actually is, and then it prevents the negative states of mind. 
Yeah. If there are no edges to you, it doesn't feel like there's any threats. As soon as you create edges and boundaries, there are people that you let into and people you push out of them. If you realize that you're fundamentally interconnected, it relaxes everything. Yeah? You know, as soon as you say, this is where I start and you begin, then it doesn't seem like a problem until someone comes into your territory. Yeah. Or you want to go into theirs. Right? Um, if all of it is ours, yeah, we're just trying to like widen the circle of the feeling us. Yeah. You know, you start with trying to widen the idea of what is me, but you know, think of how you are with the family members that you get along with, all right? Not the dodgy ones, right? But the ones that you like, okay? The way you are with your family members that you really like and you really enjoy spending time with. Um, the ease that you have with them being in your space. You know, they can go into your kitchen and open your cut cupboard doors and take out your cups, and it's fine. It doesn't bother you. But if some stranger came into your house and started opening your cupboards and taking out your cups, you'd be like, oh, heavens, right? It feels like some invasion, yeah? But if you're sort of in a much more spacious mind, you don't have that reaction. Yeah, so what we're trying to get into is to realize that um, the borders are illusions. And actually acknowledging that is a relief. Um, when we put up defenses, it seems like protection, but it actually creates a point of friction. As soon as you sort of drop the wall, it kind of allows, like, like water, you know, it allows it to flow freely the way that it should, the way it naturally does. When you place these false barriers, again, imagine life like water. The water hits up against the wall and kind of smacks back at you. If there was no wall there, it would just all flow, yeah? And the water droplets aren't annoyed if other water droplets touch them, right? Water molecules aren't like, hey, yeah? Um, so if you kind of think of consciousness that way, and if you think of self that way, that, okay, arbitrarily you can say, this river has this name, but really it's all just water. It freeze it up. Yeah, prevents defensiveness, prevents that feeling of isolation, prevents feeling alienated. Yeah, so um, anyway, we just experiment. It's an experiment, see how it goes. Um, so, any other questions before we do another meditation? Or comments? Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Yeah. Am I going too fast in the meditation? Too fast, anybody? No. Perfect. Too quiet. Too quiet. A little bit. Okay, let's turn up the volume on myself. meditation, you go like the, uh, yeah, a little too quiet. Yeah, yeah I'll yeah. yeah I will turn up my own volume. Yeah. <laughs> you can get little pieces of paper and throw them at me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. No, but I can, I do do that. That's a that's a common complaint. I must remember. Which is merely labeled by the mind. I host you. Okay. Can we increase by one? The beginning, the temperature, merely labeled by <laughs> <laughs> If there is consensus, sure. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Can I ask another question? Yeah. I always would look about the, the animals, female, male attraction. It comes mm -hmm. from the other side. By smell, how do you look at it? Habit. It's habit. Habit. Yeah. But it was not learned as a habit. It comes from the inner side for us. But, but, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's because we believe in. Outside. Of course, yeah, but we, we believe in past lives, right? So, you know, the, the, the things we call instinct, yeah, mm -hmm. we would just say habit, right? It's just habit. So at some point, all beings were kind of formless, 
made of light. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mm -hmm. know, back in the day, right? If we're doing like ancient history, mm -hmm. folktale Buddhism. Um, and then because of the attachment, we started wanting to consume, and then we had to create bodies that could process consumption and that could uh, procreate and reproduce, right? And then we developed these habit strategies of, okay, we will have male ones and female ones, and they will make whole other ones, and this kind of thing started to happen. And now many, many spe species have two genders, but, you know, lots of species have all sorts of weird things that happen with gender. It's not like it's that binary, is it? You know, and so what makes sense to them, the animal realm, is completely a result of their mental reflections, right? So the situation that we're in as human beings is completely a reflection of our mental state. Same with animals. So if, you know, if this is a pleasant temperature or an unpleasant temperature, is a direct result of our karmic predispositions. But because we have a human body, there's a certain point where we would all agree it's uncomfortable, right? But the kind of like gray area, that's very individual, yeah? So there are things that are in common with all species, you know, with all, all beings of one species, and then there are things that are individual to that specific individual within the species, right? Like even think about dogs, how different their personalities are from one another. You think, okay, they're all dogs, but then if you meet several, you're like, huh, quite different. You know, so there's a shared dog experience, but then there's the individuals, right, within that place. So um, from a Buddhist perspective, we've all been female and male and animals and humans so many times. Some people respond to the bi biology they're born into in a certain way, and some people respond differently to it, kind of depending on what just happened before. Yeah, kind of what they've been used to. So it's, you know, so these labels become a little bit more fluid quite naturally. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know, uh, th does that answer your question? Yeah, ish, sort of. ish. Yeah, and... I to see the position uh, of reflecting from the outside or the reflecting on it. Yeah. So I try to look to see if there is any difference in this kind of, of instinct. There's something yeah. I'm reflecting to something and it's not only my mind. No, it's not. It's not. But what created the, like, the distinction of what is outside and what is inside seems quite clear, but as soon as you explore it, where one starts and the other ends becomes quite abstract. And what created the physical environment is more complex than just some sort of physical science reality. Although we fully believe in the scientific explanation, we just think there's more to the story than that. Yeah, so we, you know, we believe in evolution. It's just we believe in some deeper level that made the evolution happen in the first place. You know, results of our own minds. Yeah, so sci science and Buddhism usually are good friends. <laughs> it's just there, you know, it's kind of, we explain the why differently, but the how and the, you know, it's kind of in common. It's like, yeah, that's what happens, but the reason we explain slightly differently. Yeah, yeah it's quite interesting. So anyway, good not to be an animal, <laughs> even though they look like they're having fun. Okay, so, um, so we're going to do the um, meditation on, um, let's see, how much time do we have? Yes, we're going to do the meditation on the repulsiveness, so don't go into um, some weird self-loathing, okay? Uh -huh. <clears throat> 